Okay, welcome guys. Um, November 8th, this is the uh, November general membership meeting for Rhode Island Beekeepers Association. Um, just gonna give a quick um, rundown of some club business before we bring our guest on this, this afternoon. Uh, if you haven't seen Facebook or if you haven't gotten the email yet, our yearly elections are coming up. Um, the way we do elections, we have a nominating committee. Those people collect the names of anyone interested in running. Uh, if you want to nominate someone, someone you think, you know, would do like a great job in a certain position, uh, you can contact those members of the nominating committee. Uh, the those members are Kevin Kennedy, Sue Loomis, and Sue Medden. Um, contact either in the email you should have received or on Facebook. Um, Certainly, if you have questions, send me an email or post it on Facebook and we'll get that to you. But um, we have five elected um, positions in the club. President, uh, myself currently, Vice President Sarah Michaud currently, uh, Treasurer is Jennifer Bristol, Secretary is Steve Burke, and then member at large right now is Dr. Jane Dennison. Uh, as of right now, the only member I know who isn't going to seek their position again is Dr. Jane. Uh, so we know that there is going to be an opening on that, but guys, feel free. If you don't like the job I'm doing, throw your hat in the ring. Um, you know, new blood is always, you know, appreciated in this organization, uh, whether at the top or in our committees or, you know, in whatever form you want to give it. Um, so yeah, that's uh, the election itself is going to be virtual. Obviously, uh, we'll send out a ballot, an email ballot. Um, the date on that is going to be November 30th. So it's going to be a, a day, day long thing. It'll be open, submit it anytime during the day. I'm going to close it at 10 PM that night. Uh, and then we'll have the, the results basically instantly. Um, for those of you who have asked about our beginning B school, uh, we are doing B school again. Uh, the final details are still being ironed out. It's most likely going to be January. Um, Typically, that's when we hold a live B-School. Um, Betty Mancucci and Steve Burke are going to be our teachers once again. They're offering classes at different times. So depending on what your schedule is, you know, one might be a night class, a, a day class. And the classes themselves are probably not going to be as long as we've done in the past, where it was like a two-hour live class, because we know that the Zoom format for two straight hours is just too fatiguing. Um, so probably going to try to break that up a little bit. Uh, again, we will have the final details of that and we'll start, uh, you know, advertising for that for those of you who might want that or uh, have friends that you know who want that. Uh, we also have a nice opportunity that Ed Szymanski brought to us. Um, Norfolk County beekeepers had been doing an intermediate class online. Uh, I guess, Ed, I believe you have kind of run that program. Um, so they have very graciously said that they're going to allow Reba members to avail themselves of that this, this coming year, which I think is like a great opportunity. Um, I mean, you guys all know Ed, he's been grabbing our speakers for this year. Um, you know, he's one of the people who, when I think of who, who really knows their, you know, who knows the craft of beekeeping and ha has like a good head on their shoulders for the way Reba, you know, envisions how things should be done. And that's Ed. So we know, uh, you know, if you do, you know, choose to do that Norfolk class, you're going to be getting, you know, information that you can rely on, which is, you know, as you know, it's so important, continuing education. Um, the December meeting, we are still planning it. It's going to be a more uh, casual. Um, another shout out to Ed. I mean, he's been doing such a great job all year getting like real high class, like marquee names as far as speakers go. Um, we're going to do something a little more down home for the December meeting, um, you know, drawing more from the membership. It'll be probably a little more of a variety show format versus, you know, one single speaker. Um, but just like a, a kind of nice, fun way to close out the year um, on a little more casual note than, you know, a long form discussion. Uh, and then going into 2021, he's got already... Um, Three great speakers lined up for, for the first couple months, January, Dan Conlon, uh, who spoke maybe two years ago. 
at one of our uh, banquets, Dan Conlon from uh, Warm Colors Apiary. Uh, in February, we have Bill Hesback, who I don't believe has ever spoken to Reba. He's an EAS master beekeeper. Uh, I know he was the head of Connecticut, um, Connecticut Beekeepers Association at some point. He's a published author, uh, real, real smart guy. And then in March, we have rescheduled Aaron Forbes, who was supposed to speak with us last month, and we had that famous snafu. Um, so she will be here in March. Great speaker, so we're looking forward to getting her back. Um, that's really all I have. Um, I mean, I, I hope you guys have, you know, been out in your your yards um, this weekend. I mean, God, how gorgeous was it? You know, watching the hive entrances this morning. They're bringing in pollen. Bees are coming and going. Um, I was actually surprised. I, I saw a, a honey collecting pollen on catmint. Um, the catmint that's even barely even in bloom, but th there were actually foragers on it collecting pollen. Um, you know, this late in the air, which is uh, pretty interesting to see. But it's, you know, really good time, obviously, if you get those kind of last minute um, winterizing tasks that you got to take care of, get some feed on there. Um, you know, for those of you who do more involved kind of high furniture maintenance, um, you know, get out there, do what you got to do. Um, you know, this is a good time to do it. It looks like it's going to be warm into the next week, too. So you probably get a little more time if you still need to bulk up hives with them. Um, liquid feed, uh, last minute treatments, taking treatments out. Uh, those are you using Apivar, don't leave those strips in all winter. Um, 42 to 56 days per the label, you wanna get them out, leaving it in, that's how mites build resistance to these chemicals. So, you know, it's one of the ones that still is pretty effective for us. We wanna make sure that we can use it going forward in the future when we need it. Um, so pay attention to those labels. Um, you know, they're on there for a reason, protect you as the applicator, protect the health of the bees and protect your potential clients for your, you know, honey or other high products. Um, that's why we, we, we always really hammer down that the label is the law. Um, without any further ado, I'm gonna introduce our featured guest for today, um, Dr. Howard Ginsberg from URI. Uh, I, unlike most of our speakers who, are from more purely honeybee, um, you know, research or, you know, education. Um, I, I believe Dr. Ginsberg works more with native bees. Um, and this talk he has for us today is something a little different because it's not strictly, you know, honeybee maintenance or, uh, you know, honeybee management or, you know, bee biology, but it's gonna potentially impact how you keep your bees or how you think about keeping your bees. Um, you know, and how we protect pollinators in general. Um, I'm looking forward to it because this is a topic I personally don't know a ton about. Um, so with that, I'm gonna bring on Dr. Howard Ginsberg. Great, uh, can I share my screen now to- uh, You should be able to. Let me try that. All right. Can you see that? The title uh, slide there, everyone sees it? Okay, good. Um, yeah, I, I am at your, I don't actually work for the university. I work for the uh, USGS, US Geological Survey, uh, Department of Interior. It's the kind of the research uh, agency in Interior. We have a small research station at URI. So uh, uh, I work there, I'm professor in residence there, but I'm not paid by the university. I, the, the kind of center that we're, our little, group is uh, uh, attached to is the Tuxent Wildlife Research Center, which is in, in Maryland. So um, I wanted to start by talking about some of the, the bee research that's going on at URI, which might be of interest to you. And, and after that, I'll get into the uh, business of, uh, you know, vector management and, and bee protection. Uh, these are the three kind of main types of projects going on. And I'll talk about them just, just very briefly, let you know what's going on. Uh, first is the Bees of Rhode Island project. Uh, as you know, you know, honeybees, of course, there's several species scattered around the world, but bees in general, there are about 20,000 species worldwide, most of which are solitary little critters that live in holes in the ground or in uh, you know, hollowed out twigs, things like that. Uh, these are the five most common uh, families in Rhode Island. There's one other family you get. 
Uh, we, we've been compiling uh, these pieces from the URI collection, which goes back to about 1900. Uh, the the uh, uh, database at the American Museum of Natural History and just our own uh, collections. And that, now the count in Rhode Island is up to about 250 species. I'm guessing there are several more, uh, but that's that, uh, kind of part of the uh, of what we're doing. And one of the uh, studies that, uh, kind of survey studies was done out at Napa Tree Point, which you might know it's out uh, on a sandbar off of Watch Hill down there. We took some samples out there and compared it with the Carter Preserve and the Great Swamp for comparative purposes. And it was kind of interesting. These were the uh, most common bees at, at the inland versus the coastal sites. And at that coastal site, which is essentially a sandbar with a few uh, you know, shrubs and trees scattered around, uh, the common species were all twig nesting species. This uh, serotonin, those are small carpenter bees that nest in twigs. Uh, this species nests in rotting logs. Uh, there was a, uh, this, uh, this one's a sand dune associate. On the mainland, on the other hand, it was soil nesters were the common one. These two most common species all nest in soil. So you see the availability of nesting sites determines which of these you know, solitary and primitively social species uh, you get. Uh, the other thing is a uh, blueberry pollinage. I've been working with Steve Alm, who you might know. He's a, he's a beekeeper, but also interested in, in uh, wild bees. And he, uh, he's worked with a lot of his grad students looking at blueberry pollination, high bush blueberry pollination in the state of Rhode Island. So they did one survey of all commercial uh, uh, blueberry farms and uh, uh, surveyed the species there. Uh, not many honeybees, mostly these wild species. Uh, these are bumblebees, bee and Andrina are, is a group of solitary bees. Uh, this is the proportion of their pollen loads that were blueberry pollen. You can see they had a lot of blueberry pollen, which meant they're probably pretty good pollinators. Uh, for blueberries, but it's kind of blueberries are kind of interesting. In that it, it, if you look at a blueberry flower, the anthers that uh, have the pollen are tubular, a little pore at the end, and the way most bees get the pollen out is they kind of settle on the end and they vibrate their flight muscles, and that vibration results in the pollen puffing out, just shooting out the end of the anther, and they get a puff of the pollen on themselves. And if they have some pollen on themselves, they fertilize the flower. Uh, honeybees don't do that buzz behavior. Uh, bumblebees do, a lot of wild bees do. So honeybees are not uh, all that efficient at pollinating blueberry, but if, you know, of course you bring a hive there, you have a lot, a lot of bees there, so they uh, can do the job. But wild bees do a reasonably good job in most of the Rhode Island uh, blueberry farms. Uh, but but uh, Sarah Tucker, who's a, a master's student, was interested in, in this critter, the, uh, the, the carpenter bee, the large carpenter bee. You've seen these things around, you know. Uh, very buzzy critters, and they will visit uh, blueberry flowers. They do the buzzing, the buzz pollination, but sometimes if they're there after nectar, they don't want to bother sticking their tongue all the way into the flower to get the nectar out. So they pierce the side of the flower, make a little hole in the flower, and suck the nectar out that way. And of course, if they do that, they don't pollinate the flower. So the question is, does nectar robbery affect uh, pollination of the blueberries? Um, now, this kind of nectar robbery behavior is known in a lot of different bees and on a lot of different flowers. And what people find is sometimes it lowers fruit set because there's fewer visitors visiting the flower the right way. Sometimes it increases fruit set. And the hypothesis there is that since there's less nectar in a flower, the bees visit more flowers and there's better pollination. But in many cases, there's no effect. And that's what, what uh, Sarah found here. Uh, no difference between uh, the flowers that have been slit and the nectar robbed and that probably because there are so many pollinators there that, that all flowers were very pollinated very quickly. So that was kind of an interesting study. The other thing is uh, Dr. Uh, Steve Alm, who I, I don't know if, how many of you know him, but he, he is a beekeeper. He's also interested in varroa mites. So he's been trying a variety of approaches to try to deal with varroa mites. And I, I am not a beekeeper. I've not been involved in this. But he's tried uh, heat treatments and powdered sugar, and he's been working with a chemist, Matt Klaswetter, in the chemistry department, to try to come up with slow-release uh, approaches using kind of precursors of some toxic chemicals that you could put in the hive in an appropriate container, and they will release naturally as, as the chemical uh, degrades and give you long-term uh, control. So there, there is work going on there, and I don't uh, might be worthwhile talking to Steve. I don't know how far he's gotten in that, that research. 
Okay, so uh, vector-borne diseases and pollinator protection. Uh, uh, there's a group called Pollinator Partnership. That's their website, which is a, a kind of a, a bee conservation organization. And there's an associated group called NAPSI, North American Pollinator Protection Campaign, which is kind of a consortium of uh, people who work with bees, uh, university scientists, uh, 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 government scientists like me, uh, uh, beekeepers, uh, farmers and growers, uh, people from uh, industries, you know, uh, uh, pesticide industries, but uh, chemical companies, but also uh, farm products industries, you know, berries, et cetera. And they all get together. And the idea of this organization is they're not, everyone's not going to agree on what ought to be done or what not to be done, but there are areas where they can agree. So let's get together and figure out areas that everyone agrees about. We can do something to help protect pollinator populations. So I, I was on the steering committee of this group for several years. I dropped off a couple of years ago, but when I was on the steering committee, I was, uh, late one day on one of the conference calls and uh, uh, just, just 10 minutes late when I got on, I was head of a task force. It's one of those things that happens. Um, the task force I was on is something that they'd been interested in doing, which is uh, dealing with this question. You know, th there are a lot of pesticides and other approaches used to control ticks and mosquitoes. Do those affect pollinators, including bees? And if so, how can you modify those practices to Protect public health while minimizing minimizing uh, effects on bees. And a little background about myself to understand why I was selected. Uh, George Ackworth, he was my uh, major professor when I was a grad student back in the 1970s at Cornell, so a long time ago. And George was a bee biologist, studied mostly wild bees. Um, so I, my thesis was on wild bees, looking at the foraging patterns of the, of the bees. Uh, after I finished, I was had various jobs, and my they were soft money jobs at first postdocs, and money was disappearing. And a request a request for proposals came for someone to study the moving patterns of mosquitoes. And I said, "Well, I did bees; I can do mosquitoes." So I wrote a proposal, got the, a research contract. And that was at Fire Island National Seashore National Park. Um, did that for a few years, and then uh, the park service people asked me what needed to be done with mosquitoes, and I said, "Frankly." People are getting Lyme disease from these ticks all the time. Someone should study the ticks. So I went to study the ticks. Uh, it's uh, my career has been, uh, you know, a pattern of studying progressively more and more repulsive arthropods. George used to say my career is going steadily downhill, but that meant that when this question came up, I was one of the few people who had kind of a foot in both worlds, the bee world and the, the vector world. So that was why I was put in charge of this uh, task force. So here was the task force. Um, I tried to get members of this task force who gave a huge, had a huge variety of knowledge and interests. So, well, Steve Om, who is agricultural uh, entomologist, works with bees, uh, also pesticide expert. Tim Barger worked on um, uh, non-target effects of pesticides. Paul Bucky, ornithologist, several bee people, uh, pesticide chemist, a uh, person who worked for a pesticide uh, 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 mosquito control company, uh, a mosquito control expert from uh, Maine, Dominic Nervaci. He was the uh, head of uh, mosquito control for, for Suffolk County, uh, New York, and just a variety of people. Tom Steger, EPA, a pesticide expert. And so I wanted people with expertise in the different critters that might be affected by these pesticides, but also people who actually knew the practical aspects of pesticide use and, and practices that might uh, be useful for tick and mosquito control, but that might also affect bees and other pollinators. So here is the result. It was two years of meetings. Um, we uh, put this all together and published this uh, uh, paper in the um, uh, Journal of Medical Entomology as a forum piece talking about, you know, uh, 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 tick and mosquito control methods, which ones might affect pollinators and uh, how one might think about modifying those in such ways to, to maintain public health protection, but minimize negative effects on, on bees and other, other pollinators. So um, uh, what, what I'll do at first is to go through kind of the general kind of conclusions we came up with in just very general terms. Now those weren't specific to honeybees, but they included honeybees. Uh, but then uh, I'll spend some time talking about the specific 
vector-borne diseases that are real problems in Rhode Island, in particular Lyme disease, which is the biggest one, the tick-borne disease, and Eastern Equine Encephalitis virus, uh, mosquito-borne, and as you know, last year was an epidemic year for that, for that virus. So let's, let's talk about the general conclusions from this. First thing was going through the variety of uh, uh, control methods available for mosquitoes and ticks. So uh, mosquito control methods, huge variety of, of uh, methods available. And we kind of went through these trying to figure out which ones might affect bees and other pollinators. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, mosquito larvae live in, in the water. That's uh, anything that you apply to water is not likely to affect bees all that much. But the adults, once the adults are flying around, they're all over the place. Anything you do, I mean, obviously self-protection precaution is very important, but anything you do to control adults can potentially affect pollinators as well. Ticks as well, a uh, whole variety of different approaches uh, that are available. Uh, we talked a little bit about some of the real uh, innovative things that people are coming up with now, the genetic uh, practices and stuff, but uh, those aren't in general use now. So we concentrated on the things that are now generally used around the country. So here was the, uh, uh, the conclusions of what are the three types of control methods that are most likely to affect pollinators. Obviously, landscape ma manipulation. You, you manipulate landscapes to get rid of mosquito habitat. Uh, you could potentially affect habitat for pollinating species. That's not much of an issue for honeybees. I mean, honeybee is a domesticated animal, really. You keep the hives yourself. Simpler with biocontrol. Most of the biological control agents used for ticks and mosquitoes would not affect honeybees. Pesticide applications, that's another story. Obviously, pesticide applications can affect uh, uh, pollinators in general, uh, including honeybees. So I, in my talk, I'll concentrate more on the pesticides than on the other types of control mechanisms. Okay, so these were the uh, kind of the general considerations that we came, I'm not gonna go through all these. In, in general, uh, considering effects uh, locally and considering effects uh, in the planning stage uh, of uh, the vector management program, uh, develop a targeted management, uh, research recommendations, et cetera. But the big things in terms of honeybees are, the, are, are these two principles. Uh, one, the idea of uh, local collaborations of people with knowledge of the vectors, the ticks and mosquitoes you have to deal with, but collaborating with people with knowledge of the pollinators. And in the case of this group, uh, honeybees. Uh, general, I mean, I've been working with mosquito control people for a long time, and when they plan what they're going to do, they rarely think about pollinators or, or honeybees. They think uh, if they're going to do an aerial application, uh, they have certain considerations. They don't want to spray over, say, uh, organic farms or something. But how it might affect bees, it's generally not considered. So one of the big recommendations is to get that, those people together with that knowledge so that in the planning stage, uh, the uh, vector control people will be aware of where the vulnerabilities are for, for uh, you know, uh, bees, flies, uh, butterflies, and honeybees in particular, and having that local knowledge. It has to be local because the, the disease problems are different in different areas, and so are the pollinator issues. So in Rhode Island, we have, you know, uh, uh, Eastern equine cephalitis and, and Lyme disease. In uh, uh, Colorado, Neither of those particularly important. Uh, West Nile virus is important. Colorado tick fever, maybe different types of problems, and also the, the kind of spectrum of pollinators that are out there also differ. Although both would have honeybees. The other thing is uh, efficient management or targeted management. Um, this is something you know. You know, I I first started doing this work on Fire Island National Seashore, and uh, I later started working for the Department of Interior and did a lot of consulting with national parks on exactly this problem. That is, uh, the national park is charged with maintaining the, the natural resources in the park, you know, the, the natural features and the wildlife there, but they also have to protect public health. So if you have a vector-borne disease uh, in the park, Lyme disease or encephalitis, how do you protect public health, the, the staff, the visitors to the park, without damaging the natural resources that the parks uh, are charged to protect. Now, if you go to someone who's charged with uh, 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 vector control, say the head of a local mosquito management uh, agency, they have a very different type of, of uh, issue because 
their phone is ringing off the hook. I'm being bitten by mosquitoes. What are you going to do about the darn mosquitoes? And so their in, uh, inclination is to do some kind of intervention. Uh, and there has generally been acrimony. You know, you have the, uh, the conservation groups, the, the green bloods, as they call themselves, and park service, and you have the, the vector control people. And there's very often acrimony between those groups. And I worked with this, trying to work these things out for, for a long time. It took me a decade, and I finally realized there's one area of commonality for both groups. And let me talk about that a little bit here. That is efficient management of the diseases. And the reason that that is an area of commonality for both groups is because if you look from the point of view of public health, you know, a mosquito management agency has a certain amount of money, certain amount of resources available. If they use those resources efficiently, well targeted towards the vectors, fewer people get sick than if you use them inefficiently. I mean, an aerial pesticide application is very expensive and very inefficient. It kills almost any arthropod that it hits. So they, they, so they it, it works for them if you can be more efficient and better targeted about management. From the point of view of pollinators, the more efficient you are and the better targeted you are, you're targeting at the vectors, less likely to cause damage to bees and other non-targets. So this area kind of, and, and I've worked for a long time with Suff County Vector Control with Fire Island National Seashore. And I think probably the thing I'm happiest about now is that those people work together, the park and the vector control people, they know each other, they know what their constraints are, and they don't always come to, you know, the most uh, the solution that will satisfy everyone, but in general, they understand what the issues are, and they do, I think, a pretty good job of being efficient about management of the uh, vector-borne disease issues. So, that, so that's kind of the theme of what I'm going to talk about. So let me talk about some of the local, uh, the local problems. Uh, uh, I'll have to talk a little bit about the vectors and the diseases, uh, and then talk about management. So here's Lyme disease, which is really the biggest one. I mean, uh, nationwide, the CDC gets reports of about 30,000 cases a year nationwide. The fact is the actual number, because not every case is reported, the actual number from hospital records, et cetera, is probably close to about 300,000 cases per year. So it's a pretty severe uh, uh, disease load. And it's concentrated in the Northeast. I mean, we're right in the, the middle of it here, and in the Northern Midwest, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin. So there's the pathogen. It's a it's a bacterium, a sparky little corkscrew shaped thing that goes corkscrew through the through the fluid. There's the tick vector. Those are adults uh, of Exodus capillaris, black legged tick or deer tick, and there are a variety of uh, reservoirs. These are animals in which the bacteria live, and if a tick bites one of those animals, you know, especially mice, shrews, uh, chipmunks, occasionally uh, a few birds, not birds too, usually, but uh, they they will. Um, you see the tick there on the bird's eye, by the way, engorged. Um, so if a, a, an uninfected tick bites one of these critters that's infected, picks up the bacteria, then it most to the next stage, the next stage could potentially bite a person, transmit uh, Lyme disease to that person. So here's the seasonal cycle. It, it, in Rhode Island, it's a two year life cycle. The eggs are laid in the spring, the eggs hatch typically late July and the larvae come out. That's a little tiny first stage of this tick. They are not infected with Lyme disease. They do have some other pathogens, not, not Lyme back bacteria. They take a, a blood meal, they feed. A, a lot of what they feed on are those small animals, uh, mice, voles, shrews. They pick up the bacteria over winter, and then they come out as a second immature stage, the nymph, following spring. They nymphs around here, they start late May, uh, kind of peak in June, and kind of tailing off in July and August. So June is when uh, most people are getting bitten by these things. That's when most people get Lyme disease in the Northeast is, is June. You know, they're, they're, they get bitten by the, the nymphs in June. They start feeling sick in late June or, or July. So they take a blood meal, they molt to the adult stage. The adults come out starting in October. Uh, the adult stage is out now. Uh, not as many people get Lyme disease from adults. There, uh, the thing is, if you look at infection rate, nymphs 25 to 30 percent typically are infected. That's a really high infection rate. Adults 40 or 50 percent. But adults are out in the fall when there are few people out in tick habitat. People are wearing, uh, you know, long sleeves, long pants. The adults are large. People see them and knock and flip them off. The nymphs are really small. People are out there in shorts and flip flops. They don't even see them and they get bitten. And that's why people get Lyme disease that time of year. And they stay, have to stay attached for a while. 
typically 24 to 48 hours before they transmit. So the fact that these are very small and people don't notice them is part of the reason that there's so much Lyme disease at the time of year. Here's kind of, you know, there's the larvae and there's the nymphs, there's the adults, and it's when the nymphs are out, that's when people are getting Lyme disease. There's a nymph compared to someone's finger. You see how small they are. You know, they're visible if you look for them, but you really got to look hard. It's, it takes really diligent looking and they might be, you know, in your armpit, they might be in your hair. And if you don't look very carefully, you don't see them. But what I tell people to do is if they've been out and, you know, take habitat in, in that time of year, and they get back, check themselves carefully, you run your fingers through the hair. If you feel anything hard, run your fingernail over it, if it clicks, it's probably, it could be a tick. And you have to have someone pull it out and pull it straight out because the longer it stays attached, more likely it is to transmit. As I said, it takes, you know, a, a day or two to transmit the, the pathogen. Okay, where are these ticks located? Well, the adults, the ones that are out now, they're fairly broadly distributed. Woods, kind of shrub thickets and meadows, they're out in all of those. Uh, they love animal trails. They like deer, like to feed on deer. So if you follow a deer trail through a thicket this time of year, you will encounter adult deer ticks. That's the adult female. The male is a little smaller and just black. Okay. Uh, again, uh, they're easy to see, and, easy, and people tend to flick them off and find them if they're attached and remove them. Oh, yeah, yeah. The easiest way to remove a tick, get a fine tweezers, grab it, as close to the skin as you can. You want to get by the mouth parts there and just pull it slowly straight out. That's the easiest and best way to do it. All right, the nymphs, the ones that are most important at people getting Lyme disease, uh, the ones that are out in, in you know, May, June, July, into August. They're in the woods. This is a critter that lives in the leaf litter. They spend most of their li lives down in the leaves. They come up to seek hosts and they sit on top of the leaves or on twigs. So when you walk through the woods, they get on your feet, on your shoes, and they walk their way up. And when they find a place that seems suitable, they try to attach. And again, they're very small. You may not even know that they're there. You know, so that's, this is the, the danger stage in terms of transmission of Lyme disease to people. So uh, what chemicals are used for control of these things? Here's uh, this is a table from that uh, paper we published from the task force. And these are uh, most of the chemicals that are used very uh, uh, widely for mosquito and tick control. Uh, these are pyrethroids. These chemicals here are related to pyrethrin. Uh, these are organophosphates. Uh, fipronil is the same thing as used for top spot for your pets. There's some uh, uh, devices that use that for tick control as well. Um, and the features of these chemicals are what determine how dangerous they are for honeybees. Here's toxicity to honeybees, which is, you know, these are all fairly toxic. Micrograms per bee, the very small, very low levels. Less than one microgram per bee is, it kills, LD50 means it kills half of the test animals. Uh, solubility, likelihood to move in the environment, uh, persistence. These are all factors that are important in determining how likely are they are to get to bees and maybe cause a problem for bees. The other thing that's not on this table is a formulation. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit as well. So targeting pesticides in such a way that they don't affect bees. Well, for tick control, you know, you can target them as the, at the host animals. And there are a lot of products out to do that. Uh, these tick tubes, uh, they are essentially little cardboard tubes with cotton balls in them. The cotton balls have been soaked in a pesticide. They usually use permethrin, which is a pyrethroid uh, permethrin, permethrin pesticide. Um, and you put these out in the environment and mice, white-footed mice is the most important host for the bacteria in nature. They like the cotton balls. They like to bring it back to their nest and line their nest with the nice dry cotton balls. So the pesticide kills the ticks in the mouse nest on the mouse. It's very well targeted. Uh, how well does it work? Well, I did some studies with this stuff on Fire Island and it turns out if you, have, uh, if you have full coverage of an area, or one of these tubes every, roughly every 10 yards, full coverage of fairly wide area, uh, it does a reasonably good job at lowering the infection rate in the ticks. Doesn't, didn't no, lower the number of ticks, it lowered the proportion infected because it was targeting the most important host for the bacterium. Uh, however, if you only get partial coverage, didn't work hardly at all. If you have an area with a lot of natural areas around the treated areas that 
my come in from untrue years didn't work that too well that way either. But it at least can be can contribute to control and is not likely to affect bees, especially not honeybees. Here are bait boxes. These are now available. These things have a, a, a bait in them that attracts small animals. They, they go in to get the bait and there's a, a wick there with a pesticide that rubs the pesticide on, on, the, uh, on the fur of the animal and kills the ticks on, on the hosts. Uh, similar types of results for that. That's had some very good results in some situations. You want full coverage. You want to make sure that they don't, uh, things that, you know, the bait doesn't dissipate or something. Um, uh, however, if you have a lot of, uh, you know, alternative hosts or you have a lot of access from uh, other areas, uh, again, these will give you some protection. I, I think the, the uh, yeah. there have been several trials of this. In fact, there's some trials that are going on right now using uh, integrated methods, these integrated with other methods, and we'll see how they work out. So, but I think those can contribute to a management program by themselves. They won't solve your problem, but they can help. Here's one targeted towards deer. Now, deer are not hosts for the bacteria, but the deer is the main host for the adult tick. So if you have lots of deer, you have lots of adults, each adult lays lots of eggs. Female lays about, you know, 1500 eggs roughly on the average. So if you can kill the adults on the deer, you'll have many fewer ticks and presumably less Lyme disease. So this is a four poster. It was developed by people um, in USDA uh, in uh, Texas for control of uh, 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 ticks on, on cattle, but it, they also uh, have a version that works on deer. And essentially it's a hopper with the corn niblets and the deer feed on the corn niblets. And then there's these paint rollers that have a pesticide on them. So when the deer is feeding on the, on the, the, uh, the corn niblets, it gets pesticide on its ears and the nape of the neck, that's where most of the ticks are on a deer. And uh, there was a, a, a big study of these. It gave on the average about 70% control, which is good. Doesn't solve the Lyme disease problem, but it, can, it helps. Um, broadcast pesticide applications. This is where bees are, tar uh, can potentially be targeted. Now, um, uh, in terms of, uh, 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 Tick control. I mean, people in general encounter Lyme disease uh, in this uh, very domestic environment, either in their backyards or if they go out uh, uh, camping or hiking, or if they're uh, doing activities in local parks. So it's a kind of uh, very often a lot of the exposure is in residential and semi-residential areas, and so some people uh, use pesticide applications of this nature to try to control ticks on their yards. Now. That of course will kill any bees that 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 uh, are sprayed. So so how do you deal with that? Well, um, one thing to keep in mind is where where the ticks are on on the yard uh, in the lawn. Uh, remember, this is that I showed before. The, the the nymphal stage of the ticks are primarily in the woods, not in open habitats like lawns. There was a study that Mary Carroll did at URI back in the nineties. She uh, went to, this was done on Prudence Island, and she went uh, collecting ticks with a drag cloth and uh, at different distances from the woods. This is, these were yards that backed up on the woods, and most of the ticks were right at the edge of the woods. Numbers declined as you went into the, into the lawn proper. Now, the reason for this is, is very clear. We've done some studies, survival studies on these ticks, and uh, if, uh, these ticks require a moist environment. That's why they, they spend so much time in the leaf layer to hydrate. If you put them in an environment uh, below about uh, you know, 82 to 85 percent humidity, they start losing water. So if, if you have an environment that's 75 percent humidity, which is fairly humid to us, but that's so dry that uh, a nymphal tick or a larval tick will not survive long in, in that environment. Okay? So if you keep your lawn cut short, keep the, 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 the ground dry, very few ticks in that environment, they just won't live that long. You know, they might be there for a while, but they, they die fairly quickly. So, but that means if you want to do this kind of pesticide application, you want to do it where the, the, the ticks are, which is mostly at the edge of the woods. So if you're doing an application in the yard and you have flowers there, well, you, gotta, you want to get rid of those flowers before you do pesticide application, because the bees are going to be on those flowers. Similarly, if you're going to do an application on the lawn, you want to cut the lawn short so that you don't have dandelions and clovers and gill over the ground and other flowers that will attract bees. So when you do the application, you, you want to make sure there are no flowers 
and minimize bees, the uh, presence of bees. So just how you target your application can determine whether you're going to affect bees in, or not. So remove flowers from wood edge, contrary applications there. Cut the grass short to remove uh, flowers where bees might be. Uh, avoid spraying flower beds or cover them so the bees aren't there. Also formulations, I talked about formulations, you know, there, there are different formulations of pesticides. Many are just sprayed in, in, in spray, some are uh, fumigants um, or ultra low volume, but all of those get into the environment where, where bees are flying around. Uh, for ticks, you can use granular formulations. The granular formulation are small kind of tiny pebbles that have the pesticide on them and you spread them around with a seed spreader and they essentially just fall to the ground. So they're not where the bees are. The bees are up on the flowers, granules are on the ground. Then when it rains, the granules break down and the pesticide spreads around in the leaf litter. So that's a very well targeted formulation that can very effectively target ticks and minimize effects on bees visiting flowers. So there are a lot of approaches that are available to uh, protect people from, from uh, lung disease in their yards and minimize negative effects on, on uh, uh, bees. Now, the commercial applicators around, do they, how much attention do they pay to this? I don't know. I have given talks to groups like that, but that's something that, to keep in mind. Um, but you, you know, you, there are ways to, to deal with this that avoid use pesticide use altogether. And that is landscaping to avoid contact between people and ticks. Um, remember I told you that the ticks are primarily at the edge of the woods. You can put a, a fence like this. This is just a, a, a really symbolic barrier. It doesn't prevent any animal or person from moving anywhere. But if you keep people away from the edge of the woods, that will lower their likelihood of exposure to the ticks. Now this is much too close. I mean, you have a uh, canopy cover here and you have leaf litter, there are ticks in those leaves. You'd wanna move this fence maybe 10 feet this way over there so people aren't getting to those. If you did that, you'd minimize the number of ticks that people would be exposed to. Now the way I like to, to put it to people, if you, you can play ball on the yard, throwing the ball back and forth and have very small chance of exposure to ticks. But if you chase that ball into the woods, your, your chance of exposure goes way up. So this is a symbolic barrier, keep people away from the wood edge. People use uh, crushed uh, rock or uh, uh, wood chips to, to uh, make the edge unsuitable for ticks. Um, or if you have to have a suitable environment, build uh, some kind of barrier that won't support ticks. Uh, a boardwalk through the woods, uh, uh, crushed rock path, etc. So there are ways to just by, I don't know how many times I've, you know, driven past a construction site in Rhode Island and seen them doing something and say, for goodness sakes, people are going to get Lyme disease there. And if they just keep these kind of simple principles in mind, they could avoid, people could avoid getting Lyme disease and they wouldn't even know they were being protected. So I think I have given this kind of talk to uh, landscape architect people. And I must warn you that I have virtually no aesthetic uh, sense, whatever. And so whenever I talk to landscape architects, I always see their eyes rolling when I explain these things. But you could presumably have people who are good at designing landscapes who can keep this in mind and minimize Lyme disease without pesticides and without damaging, you know, bee, hurting bee populations. So Lyme, Lyme disease control is certainly possible without affecting honeybees. People target things appropriately. Mosquito-borne diseases are a little different. Um, and we have, you know, West Nile virus in Rhode Island, not common, we get maybe one case a year on the average. Estrogen equine encephalitis is very rare uh, for reasons I'll explain. Typically one case every 10 years in Rhode Island, something like that. Uh, last year, 2019 was a huge epidemic year. Uh, there were three cases in Rhode Island, 35 or 40 cases nationwide. I mean, typically uh, typical year, there are five to 10 cases nationwide of this uh, virus. And the reason has to do with the transmission dynamic. Uh, this is a bird virus. These are some of the common uh, uh, fleckers, uh, cardinals have been implicated often. Uh, this is a bird feeding mosquito. You'll see the melanura, and it lives in freshwater swamps. So this is the primary vector of this virus from bird to bird. So uh, when you have big numbers of this species in the swamps and the birds are in the swamps, it can transmit the virus from swamp to swamp. And that's one of the reasons this disease is fairly rare. This mosquito very rarely bites people, occasionally late in the season, very rarely. And you rarely have big uh, human population centers near swamps. So 
for that reason alone, you rarely get this disease getting to people. The way it gets to people is if you have a big population of this mosquito and biting a lot of birds, and so you have a lot of infected birds, then you have a mosquito with a broad host range. Called a, uh, it's called a bridge vector because it bridges this enzootic cycle, might bite a bird, pick up the virus, then later fly out of the swamp to where people are and bite a person. That's when it gets to people. So you think of areas in Rhode Island where, where they're at risk. You have uh, a lot of swamps in Southern Rhode Island, westerly right near the Chapman Swamp. That's a potential risk area for this virus. All right, so here, here's the cycle. The, the reservoirs are birds, that's where the virus is. There's that enzootic vector, the, the swamp dwelling mosquito. It bites birds, it picks up the infection, bites other birds, infection goes back and forth. Most years, that's all that happens. You don't, it, it never gets to people. If you have the coincidence of a lot of birds being infectious at the same time that you have an emergence of one of these bridge vectors, a broad feeding mosquito that might bite a bird in the swamp and then later, you know, leave the swamp and bite a person. People are essentially dead and host for this virus. That's when you can get people infected. And again, it's a, it's a rare thing. That's why there's only five or 10 cases nationwide uh, of this virus. But when that happens, it's very serious because this is a very, very virulent virus. Uh, people who, who uh, get symptoms from this virus, 30 or 40% die from it. And of those that survive, about half of them have permanent neurological deficits. So it's such a virulent virus. When it shows up at all, people get very concerned. So, all right, so here's to remind you the mosquito life cycle, the mosquito eggs, they're the larvae, they live in water, they go through a few, four instars, they pupate and then emerge as adults. And the adults, the newly emerged adults are not infected with Eastern encephalitis virus. It does not go, go the mother does not go uh, give it to her larvae. And so the adults are not infected. They go out, they bite, potentially bite a bird, pick up the virus, and then they could potentially transmit it to a person. There was a, a guy who came out on a salt marsh one day and uh, someone was there, got a picture of the mosquitoes on his back. That's the, that's the adult mosquito. Okay, so how, how do you manage the, the mosquitoes? Well, obviously the best approach is to manage the larvae. The larvae are in the water. They're not biting anybody yet. They're concentrated in known areas. You know, they're in uh, uh, sewers, they're in little ponds. You know, they're in uh, uh, wet spots, they're in puddles on the roadside. Uh, you know where they are. And the other thing about larvae is, you know, biocontrol for mosquitoes, the, the most effective biocontrol is fish because the mosquitoes stay in one place for their whole, the week or so that they're, they're in the larval stage and fish can find them and eat them. So if you have fish in a pond, they will uh, uh, eat the mosquito larvae. They're very good for biocontrol. Once the adults are flying around, biocontrol methods don't work anywhere as well because they're just flying all over the place. I'll talk about that in a minute. Also, you can use larvicides to, uh, it, at those wet spots. And, and there are larvicides that are very specific to mosquitoes and related flies. They, uh, they kill mosquitoes, black flies, midges, uh, crane flies, things like that. They don't affect other types of larvae in the water. So you can be very well targeted at larvae. And in fact, the state of Rhode Island does that. They uh, give out uh, uh, larvicides to towns that can put them in the sewers. You know, in uh, stormwater catch basins and sewers are, uh, uh, you know, that, that controls stormwater, but they have little basins that, that hold some water there and there are mosquito larvae in that water, especially the, and not so much the mosquitoes that, that transmit Eastern uh, South Africa, those are the mosquitoes that transmit West Nile virus. So this, the state gives that, those things out to the slow release formulations out to the, uh, out to the towns and they put them in the sewers and they were released over 30 days, over 90 days, and they kill mosquitoes and related flies. So it's a very well-targeted approach. Uh, however, uh, even though you do that, sometimes things get out of hand and you have infected mosquitoes out. When that happens, it, it's very hard uh, to control those mosquitoes. The, the two main things you can do is one, public education, so people do personal protection. And if you have a really high disease risk, you might start curtailing activities when the mosquitoes are flying. For example, uh, canceling uh, uh, high school uh, sports events at dusk when the mosquitoes are biting. That's something that's done when you have a real risk of, of infection. And the other thing is aerial pesticide applications, which is something that, you know, uh, it, there's no way to avoid non-target effects with that. Well, you, you minimize it as much as you can, but that is, can potentially affect bees. 
Okay, let me talk a little bit about the dynamics so you understand the seasonal cycle of this virus. Here's, uh, there's that bird feeding mosquito I talked about on the swamps. That's seasonal. Typically, uh, it's feeding on birds, a little bit of virus transmission, but th this time of year when you get the high numbers, you know, several generations per year, that's when you start getting large numbers of uh, a lot of infection in the birds. Now, a bird that's infected, is, uh, na native birds are mostly resistant to the virus. Now, uh, domestic birds like Peking ducks, for example, they, they're, they're killed by the virus or, or domestic pheasants, but the, the wild birds are not, and their immune system clears the virus very quickly. So they get infected with the virus. They have lots of virus in the blood. A mosquito can bite the, the, the bird, then pick up the virus and maybe transmit it, but the mosquito's immune system clears the virus in a few days, three to five days. So it, it, if you have the, the situation though, at this time of year, the, uh, when a, a, a lot of these mosquitoes are out there, a lot of birds are being infectious, and at that particular time, there are a lot of birds that are still infectious with the virus, still have a lot of virus in the blood, and then you have one of these ridge vectors emerging. Uh, these are the two species that were most important in 2019 in Rhode Island. This is a mosquito that uh, the larvae live in freshwater ponds with emergent vegetation. And this is a forest mosquito that lives in little wet spots in the woods. And uh, they are out, uh, this is primarily a spring species that will pop up if you have appropriate rainfall uh, later in the season. Uh, if these are out when there are a lot of infectious birds and they pick up the virus, then they can fly out of the swamp. And this is around the time, late August, September, when people start getting bitten by infected mosquitoes. And so uh, that's when most people are infected and they start getting sick in early September. Uh, here are some data from, uh, these are West Nile virus because you know, uh, Eastern supply is so rare in Rhode Island, but it's the same, different mosquito species, but the same seasonal dynamic. Here's mosquito positivity peaking in August, human cases peaking in early September. That's typical. Okay. So what about the bees? This is some uh, uh, results from my thesis work. Uh, in terms of the wild bees, you have a, a spring group, you have midsummer groups, and late summer uh, you have uh, certain late summer specialists, but these social species, the bumblebees and the honeybees, they're building their populations up. So they're really common in uh, uh, late summer, early fall. You know, you see them on, on golden rods that are all over the place in asters. Lots of honeybees, mostly collecting nectar for and you stock up for the winter and bumblebees as well. And uh, so those are the ones that are at risk when the mosquitoes are biting people, potentially exposing them to the unique encephalitis virus. So honeybees are really at risk for aerial applications. And that's the time of year when those are going to occur. Okay, so there's the common Eastern bumblebee, bumps and patients and, and honeybee. So here, here uh, this is from that uh, task force a report uh, giving people ideas about how to target to, to uh, minimize effects on pollinators. But in the case of eastern encephalitis and bees, here are the kind of the, the, the principles. Uh, if you uh, use an aerial application, there's going to be a non-target effect. Bees are potentially involved. So you do it only when necessary. And when is necessary, you need surveillance. You have to know when the mosquitoes are out there, if they're infected or not. Uh, State does that, and I'll talk about their program in a minute. And only when you have an imminent threat to, to public health do you go to that level, which is kind of a last ditch approach, uh, where you kind of, you know, the, the, the importance for public health protection is such that you'll take the environmental hit just to protect public health. Time applications appropriately, I'll talk about that in a minute. Care for targeting of areas to be sprayed. You know, there, there are some places around the country where they just put up airplanes that spray uh, hundreds of square miles. In Rhode Island, the approach is you only do what you need and you do it where there's real risk and not elsewhere. Uh, sophisticated targeting technology. The airplanes that do these applications now have onboard computers that take into account wind speed, uh, pesticide formulation, et cetera. So they're not necessarily spraying right over the area. They're spraying in such a way that the wind will take it right to where it needs to be to, to uh, get the mosquitoes that are carrying the disease. So that is reasonably good technological fix. Uh, adjusting nozzles, you know, the, the size of the droplets are important. If the droplet with the pesticide is too large, it sinks to the ground and it kills things on the ground, non-targets, it doesn't affect bees. If it's too small, it, it dissipates very quickly. If it's the right range and probably the best uh, particle range is in the 15, 25 micron range, then it will hang in the air for about, you know, four or five hours. 
So it's hanging in the air where mosquitoes are flying and potentially kill the mosquitoes. But you think about it, it's hanging in the air for, for a few hours, even, even a mild wind, three mile an hour wind, you know, an hour, it's three miles away. It's blowing three miles away in a three mile an hour. And, and while it blows away, it is diffusing. So it's gotten to the point where the, the concentration is so low, it's no longer, no longer to toxic, uh, no longer at toxic levels. So if you have the, not, the size of the droplet correct, you can effectively target the, the, the target area. And as the stuff diffuses over the next few hours, uh, the effect on bees would decline. And then finally, inform beekeepers so they know when the pesticide is being applied and they can protect their bees, keep their bees in the colony when that's happening. Okay, so here, here are surveillance results from uh, Rhode Island last, last five years. Uh, the orange is, is last year, 2019. You can see how late in the season, huge numbers of bees, and uh, excuse me, of mosquitoes. And uh, this includes those vector species that I talked about. So uh, in particular, some of those important vector species were out late in the season when this virus typically becomes a problem. That's why we had a real problem, one of the reasons we had a real problem last year. Um, the red is this year. This year we had huge numbers, uh, historically large numbers early in the season, including some of those same species that carry Eastern encephalitis. We were very worried this time, the, earlier in the season this year, that we were going to have a repeat of last year. But remember, we had a dry summer, and that dry summer knocked the mosquitoes down, and by late August, the mosquito numbers were very, very low, and we had no, we, there was, one positive pool of Eastern encephalitis midsummer and one positive deer, that was it. After that, it just dissipated. So fortunately, we did not have a repeat uh, of last year, uh, this season. Okay, uh, so spray only when you need to spray. There are guidelines uh, in uh, Rhode Island that uh, involve you know, uh, responses to different levels of risk based on surveillance, surveillance being numbers of mosquitoes and a number of mosquitoes positive. State has traps scattered around the state. Uh, they collect them weekly and they test them for the presence of virus, West Nile and Eastern Cephalitis. And so uh, given different levels of risk based on these, these categories, they then uh, determine what they're going to do. Are they going to put out public warnings? Are they going to suggest minimizing, uh, uh, you know, uh, canceling uh, uh, ball games in the evening? Are they going to go to applications of some kind or another? Um, this was the, uh, the those has 2013. These have since been updated. Uh, the list now is much more detailed than this. Uh, I, I have this there because this was one page and it came from a, a paper we published in 2013 in the Royal Island Medical Journal talking about these kinds of issues. But now it's uh, the, uh, uh, the Department of Health and the Department of Environmental Management have a whole uh, you know, two or three page uh, uh, checklist of what what determines a high risk and what determines what activity you're going to do in response to it. So that's a way of minimizing, uh, you know, a serious, uh, uh, something like a pesticide application if you don't need to do it. Um, targeting in time. This is uh, the thesis work of Chan Solom. He's got his master's at URI working on a, a variety of things. One thing is the timing of mosquito activity. This is a, a kind of mosquito that would be involved in Eastern encephalitis transmission. They're more, most active around sunset, within an hour of sunset. After sunset, the numbers decline. Here's Culex. This is a mosquito involved in West Nile virus transmission. They are active a few hours after sunset. So if you wanted to do a pesticide application to target either of those groups, you want to do it starting at sunset and for a few hours after. Of course, not much bee activity after sunset. So just by targeting in time, you can minimize effect on honeybees. And of course, if you let the beekeepers know, they can make sure to keep their, their, their hives covered and protected when the applications are going to occur in the evening. Here's some work uh, Dewey Karen, University of uh, uh, Maryland, a, a, a bee, uh, a honeybee specialist. He looked at pesticide applications. They use malathion, which is a pretty relatively heavy chemical, uh, during the daytime or during the nighttime. And he set up traps outside of honeybee hives to see when mortality was greatest. And he found when the spray was done during the day, lots of bee mortality. When the spray was done at night, much less mortality. So spraying at night, as is typically done for mosquito control, 
that itself uh, uh, talks it reasonably well at bees, especially if you can form beekeepers, so in order to keep their hives protected when the uh, uh, airplanes are out there. Uh, here were the spray zones from 2019. Uh, there were two applications. The one was in uh, this one, uh, the orange one, that was in uh, early September. And you see all those things are positive results for uh, Eastern cephalitis. That was a, a dead horse. And uh, there was a hot mosquito right in the middle of Central Falls. There were human cases in uh, uh, Coventry, West Warwick. Uh, there were uh, positive mosquito pools and positive uh, animals, uh, uh, horses and around. This was a deer, I think, and that was a deer. Um, so you could see there was positivity and uh, the, the surveillance uh, results suggested there's real human risk in these areas, especially in highly populated areas. If you get a positive human by mosquito in the middle of, of a, a highly populated area, there's an imminent risk to, to public health. Uh, the, the shape of these application areas is based on the, I mean, the idea is if you're gonna do something like this and you know there's gonna be an effect on, on, uh, uh, on wild animal, uh, you know, uh, wild uh, insects, but also potentially on honeybees, you wanna do it in such a way that it works. So the idea is have a, a, a three to five mile area so that when you trade, you knock all the mosquitoes flying around in the middle of that area. So remember infectiousness in birds only lasts a few days. So if you do that, by the time mosquitoes move in from the outside, the birds are, are now immune. You essentially stopped uh, the epidemic dead in its tracks if, if, if you do it right. And you no longer have to go back and apply again. That's the thinking behind that. So that first application was in those four areas. Uh, I should say there were three human cases uh, in Rhode Island here. All of those cases, the onset was before those applications. So by that standard, hopefully it did some good. However, there were still a lot of mosquitoes in some areas, particularly here where there had been two human cases and also westerly where, where as I've described before, is an area of potentially high risk. So there was a second application there in, in later September and we wanted to do some testing uh, to see how effective those applications were at controlling mosquitoes. So we set up uh, traps inside and outside of the, the treated areas. And here are the results of that, of, of that uh, testing. These are before the treated areas and the results outside the treated areas. Those are mosquitoes per trap before and there's after the treatment. Uh, that was in West Warwick Coventry. Uh, the treated area went from about 10 mosquitoes per trap to about one and a half. That's very effective, about 90% effectiveness. In the control area, about 13 before, about 21 after. So that was a very effective application. In the westerly area, that was, wasn't, uh, didn't cover as much area because, um, you know, you don't want to spray wetlands. Remember, fish are very good uh, uh, biocontrol agents for mosquitoes. You don't want to spray a pond and kill the fish and get rid of your biocontrol agents. So you don't want to spray open water. Uh, uh, thick canopy woods uh, interfere with spread of the, the area and, and also protected areas you want to avoid. You want to avoid organic farms. So uh, that area didn't get uh, its full coverage, uh, but they had high levels of mosquitoes before. And the treated area seemed, seemed to lower the number treated compared to the control where the number stayed about the same. But at that level, you know, uh, to give you an idea of, of um, uh, uh, nuisance levels of mosquitoes, these are, are carbon dioxide a dry ice baited light traps. At that level, you wouldn't even notice the mosquitoes. You get to about 30, that's about pest range. You'd notice mosquitoes there. Here, this would be very disturbing number of mosquitoes. So uh, the uh, recommendation with these kind of results is uh, the application helped, but especially here, there's still risk. You, you have to maintain, even though the application helped, you still have to maintain personal protection to avoid mosquito bites. Okay, so, and which is what the uh, Department of Health recommended in that case. Okay, so to kind of summarize, apply only when necessary to protect public health. The state does not do this often in Rhode Island. Uh, I've been uh, in Rhode Island since 1990 when I first came here. In that time, we've only been two uh, aerial applications to control uh, mosquitoes. One was in uh, 1996 in Westerly when uh, we had five or six different species of mosquitoes positive for Eastern and one human by the right in the middle of downtown Westerly. Did an aerial application, no human cases. And then last year, 2019, we did this application. So it's not often done, but when it's done, there is an environmental uh, cost. 
uh, based applications on surveillance, as I've explained, applies so that the application will, will be effective and that it'll target the vectors to lower disease risk. And that's what we try to do. Apply it in a way that avoids sensitive times, areas, and non-target species, and inform the public, including farmers and beekeepers, so that you know to keep your bees protected that evening when the uh, application is going to occur. So that's that's it. A summary, and I'll be glad to take any questions if anyone is interested. Thank you, Howard. Um, let me just uh, find Ed here. Um, I just I had a quick a quick uh, observation. You were talking about um, targeted spraying, and one of your one of your slides that you said only apply when necessary based on surveillance. And I really I like that point because that's something we always emphasize uh, as beekeepers trying to control varroa. Um, you know, there's always the question: Do I uh, do I apply a treatment prophylactically or do I do it based on testing? Um, we always recommend doing it based on testing. You, you get a test for your mite load. Um, because again, th these are, even though they're miticides, they're pesticides. And this is a pesticide that we're putting in a hive of bees. We want to make sure our bees are protected. Um, you know, and to minimize, there's always going to be some kind of risk. So to minimize that risk as much as possible, you do it based, as you said, based on surveillance and only when necessary. Um, and I thought that was just a good, a good corollary between the, the mosquito spraying, you know, and what we're, we're doing with. Uh, yeah, I agree. And, you know, uh, with pesticides, a, a lot of, you know, there's a, a general tendency to think that, well, if there's a recommended dose, well, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll double that and I really get them. And very often the pesticides are formulated so that if you double it, most of the pesticide ends up, you know, washing off into streams and things. Mm -hmm. So they're formulated with uh, uh, optimal effectiveness in mind. So I agree with that. That's absolutely true. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the problems with pesticides. Is, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I was gonna say, obviously this is such a, a, a hot button issue. Um, you know, for beekeepers, you know, a lot of us, we, we've all gotten into to be honeybees for different reasons. Um, you know, so what I've noticed like over the last decade is very few people get into beekeeping and are strictly into honeybees. You know, like you, you might get into beekeeping for whatever reason, but pretty soon, yeah, now you're interested in native bees. You're interested in, in butterflies and other pollinators. You're interested in local plants. You're interested, you know, it's just, it, it gives you a greater awareness of the natural world in general. And I think part and parcel of that is you start to look at things like pesticides, uh, you know, often in, in like a very reactionary way. Um, you know, our, our Facebook discussion group is very active all year long, um, you know, and especially during the summer where, you know, homeowners, you know, we were all home a lot more in general this year. We saw when our neighbors were applying, you know, true green or whatever, you know, service was coming out to spray their lawns. And we tend to have this real reactionary, um, you know, viewpoint of pesticide use. But again, we, we use pesticides as beekeepers. It, it's a necessary part of our arsenal of, of IPM controls. Um, you know, and it, it's, it's sort of disingenuous for us to think like we can use these responsibly, but then, you know, the state isn't being responsible, say, when they sprayed for for Triple E. Um, yeah. You know, I, as president of the, the club, like I get a, a ton of calls all year from from beekeepers and the public. Um, you know, my neighbor is wants to spray, like, but I have bees. You know, how how do I educate them? Or I, I've even gotten calls from people who don't have bees and say, Hey, my my neighbor has bees. You know, but you know, my grandchildren play in the yard. I want to be able to control the ticks there, but I also want to be respectful um you know to my neighbor's bees and I, like that's the that's where i think we have some real um skin in the game to to you know offer some public education uh, because this is such a complicated issue there's there's no easy you know black or white answer um but if you can kind of bring all the stakeholders together um you know like you you talked about your um 
you know, the, the program where you had, you know, pesticide application people, you had agricultural people, um, you know, it's like, I think when we can make those conversations happen, um, you know, we see each other's viewpoints and then we can work on, you know, more responsible solutions because it, again, we, we need these products in some form or another, but it's using them responsibly. You know, again, to go back to, to my intro, you know, the label is the law. If the applicators are, are using it responsibly, choosing the products responsibly, you know, we can, as beekeepers, we can still rest easy at night knowing our bees are as protected as they can be. But now we, as beekeepers, are also protected from triple E, from Lyme disease, you know, and all the other. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, you know, there's no, in general, people do mosquito control. There's no general forum where they keep people who have these kinds of interests know, beekeepers and conservationists and other people together in the planning process. That was one of the big recommendations we tried to get to that. Of course, I don't know. I, I think Rhode Island in general is much more uh, 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 stored, circumspect in use of broad spectrum pesticides than many other states are. Uh, but, you know, uh, when you have something like, sorry, I mean, there were a dozen cases in Massachusetts. They, they did fairly broad scale spraying there. But southeastern Massachusetts is a tr traditional area where eastern is a problem because of all the swamp habitat in those regions with, you know, towns kind of scattered among the swamps. So. Thank you again. Ed, did you have some uh, questions there from the chat? Uh, we do. Um, so uh, maybe that's just a comment. I was infected with Lyme last late June this year. Never saw the nymph was infected again in October after finding an embedded tick. And as a question about maybe that, that was an adult, I guess. Was it? Yeah, in October, most likely, yes. Yeah. All right, so Lewis asks, uh, he, Lewis is interested in methods of measuring bee populations. You talked about, you know, measuring numbers of bees, and he's wondering if there are any techniques that would be suitable for beekeepers to uh, measure their bee populations. Oh, measuring the numbers in, in the colony. Boy, you know, I don't, I don't, I suggest that, uh, I'm not a beekeeper myself. <laughs> so I suggest uh, perhaps Steve Alm, who is a beekeeper might be able to uh, give a suggestion. Who's, uh, gosh, the state beekeeper, uh, state bee inspector, uh, Jim. Uh, Jim Lawson. Yeah. Lawson, yeah. Lawson, perhaps they, they would be able to, Oh, yeah. In terms of wild bee populations, we, we use, uh, 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 it, well, the wild bee nests are hard to find. So we typically use uh, uh, samples from flowers as a way to, to estimate populations, you know. Uh, but for honeybees, uh, you know, when you have a, a, a colony yourself, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how you do that for your own colony. And I mean, I know a colony can go from 10,000 to 80,000 bees in a colony, which is one of the they're so good for commercial pollination. You know, to get that many solitary bees in an area is a, is a real trick. Uh, so okay. I'm not sure how you would measure that, the numbers. Uh, thank you for the info about where ticks are found. My oh, hives yeah. are right on the edge of the woods. I will now lay down landscape fabric and mulch or gravel so I'm not standing on tick prone leaf litter when inspecting my hives. So that's just a comment. I, I do think that um, people sometimes wonder, you know, when you go out in your yard and, and you come in and you've got ticks all, on you, is then that, you know, where are they, where, how am I getting these? Are they falling out of trees? And yeah, so, no, they don't fall out of trees. They're on the ground. Pretty, yeah, they're on the ground. Yeah. Yeah, there, there was a, a study done, the CDC did a study of that, and they had uh, they did this in, in Westchester County and in, in people's uh, houses, and they, uh, the number of ticks in the woods was the greatest. If you went to the edge of the woods, it was considerably less, but they're still good numbers. Uh, then you went to flower beds, there were ticks there because you know, the flowers protected the leaf litters, it's a moisture, and the lowest numbers were on the lawn proper. So that's the, the principle. Okay. See, the problem is, you know, when the nymphs are out, they're so small, the person who said that they didn't know they were bitten, that's generally the case. People generally know, and people don't always get that characteristic rash. You know, maybe 60 or 70% of the case, cases you see that characteristics the bullseye rash of Lyme disease. Uh, so uh, in general, people are exposed 
to the ticks and they don't realize it. And that's a problem. When I was doing uh, uh, tick work in the field, I had this uh, truly ridiculous thing I would go through where when I came out after a day of field work, I would undress in front of a mirror, had, uh, had a handheld mirror up to my back, my fingers through my hair, checked myself completely, then took a shower, felt all over with my hair. And then as I got dressed, checked myself again. So it was three thorough checks. And, you know, places I was working, I'd have 20 ticks a day that I would pull off. But um, people who are just walking on a, through the woods on, on a, or walking from the, 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 the uh, you know, through a little path to the beach or something and don't, would not check themselves that carefully. And it's easy to miss one of those nipple ticks. They're very small. So personal protection is really important, but it, it maintain, requires diligence. Okay, uh, what resources are available for beekeepers or homeowners who want to learn more about pesticides, safe usage, risk to bees, et cetera? Yeah, um, you could, uh, well, that, that task force report that that's, was published in 2017 in the Journal of Medical Entomology. I think I sent a copy. If you want, uh, I'd be glad to uh, uh, share it with you, but it's freely available online. Uh, uh, and that lists some of the online resources that has uh, information about the pesticides. Um, in terms of specific concern for, for bees, boy, um, I don't know of anything that would be available to the homeowner. There is a tick control handbook that's published by the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station uh, that has a lot of uh, uh, information about pesticides used for tick control. Uh, and that is written for the general uh, public. That was published 2000. You can, uh, if you go to the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, C-A-E-G, uh, C-A-E-G website, you can download that for free from there. Um, uh, beyond that, I, I, you know, the, there's always, there's always the, uh, the NAPC, the pollinator.org, pollinator protector website and the Xerces Society. Both those websites also have information that uh, I don't know if they have specific information about pesticides. But, um, you know, we, in that paper that I showed you, that, that table from, we did list uh, the pesticides most commonly used, including the ones that we use in, in Rhode Island. I, I will say there, there is, uh, you know, a lot, there's a lot of talk. We covered, talked about this a little bit in that about, uh, you know, uh, minimum risk pesticides, risk plant oils and things like that. And uh, some of those work okay, some of them don't work too well in terms of tick control, but if they kill ticks, the chances are they'll kill bees too. So you have to be a little careful about, about that. Again, just keep, you know, keep your, 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 cut your lawn and, and, and get rid of flowers at the far side before you do an application. So there won't be any bees there when you do the application. The chemicals, those chemicals all dissipate fairly quickly. So, I mean, they're, they're targeting in time uh, an, an appropriate landscape management can avoid affecting bees. Okay, uh, we have somebody heard that keeping a three foot wide path of wood chips around the perimeter of your property will prevent ticks from coming into your yard. Do you agree? Yeah, um, yeah that's actually been studied and they gave some uh, level of protection. Uh, I. Uh, wood chips or uh, uh, crushed rock. Uh, the one thing about wood chips is it's kind of like leaf litter. And if you have forest canopy, so it stays moist, there might be some ticks in there. But in general, that will any kind of barrier like that will prevent. Now remember, these uh, the ticks that carry Lyme disease, the black light ticks, they don't walk around much. They are pretty sedentary critters. They try to find a, they do a little bit of horizontal movement to find a place to seek hosts, and then they kind of sit there and wait for a host to pass by and they grab onto it. So uh, when they move onto a yard, they're typically moving on an animal. They're moving on a mouse, on a bird, something like that. And then they drop off there. Now, if they drop off on the lawn proper, they're not gonna last too long there because it's too dry. They, so they may last, last a few days, but they might likely to die there. Uh, so any, anything that, that kind of uh, minimizes movement will give you some degree of protection, not perfect protection, but it will help. Okay. 
Um, I, I guess that's about it. Uh, we had a post, somebody posted a link to a tick control handbook from Connecticut. That was the one I was referring to, written by Kirby Stafford, who's the entomologist there. And that is uh, a lot of things I talked about, they go into, into detail, including talking about some of the pesticides used for tick control. Many of the same ones used for mosquito control, but the issue with mosquito control is, you know, with ticks, you want to go towards the ground where the ticks are. With mosquito control, it's up in the air where mosquitoes are, but also bees. So uh, I'd say in terms of uh, bees, uh, mosquito control is much more of a potential problem. Yeah, okay, yeah, that is the one that I, I quickly looked at it. So I tell everybody to take a look in the chat there. There's a, there's a link to this document, which um, looks, to be, looks to be pretty good. Um, and other than that, I think, uh, looks like that's it. Yeah, I guess that's I guess that's all. I um, I personally found that to be very interesting, Howard. We thank you for uh, sharing your knowledge with us on that. Um, Scott, anything else to add? No, I just again, I, yeah, I want to thank you, uh, Howard. That that was uh, you know obviously packed with a lot of info. Uh, like I said, not not strictly honeybee related, but. I think it's really important for all of us to get, you know, some of these um, allied proficiencies under our belt. I know, um, like I said, pesticides, it's it's one of the ones for beekeepers that is such a hot button issue. Um, people just, they feel really passionately about it, you know. But again, they're, they're often coming from, a, you know, a standpoint of not having a tremendous amount of actual knowledge on it. Um, so I, I'm really appreciative you know, that you came on here and, and gave us some, something real to deal with rather than just, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, kind of how, how I feel in my gut is pesticides bad, bees good. Um, you know, it's obviously a more nuanced conversation than that. So uh, yeah, thank you again. I, I really appreciate you coming on and joining us today. Great. Okay. Well, with that, Rhode Island beekeepers, I'm going to tell you, go out and uh, please enjoy the rest of this beautiful day. Uh, again, keep in mind our elections coming up. So please contact uh, the nomination committee. Uh, those links are available on Facebook. Um, and if you have any further questions, something you didn't think of during the talk today, post it on the Facebook group and uh, we'll try to get an answer for you. And with that, I'm going to bid you all a uh, happy weekend. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Howard. Great. Uh,